Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Welcome everyone this morning. My name is Rustin Leno and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, June Andronic um, from, um, uh, from well, what used to be called NICTA, is now called Data61 uh, in Australia. Um, June has a uh, long experience in uh, verifying various kinds of systems uh, for, uh, for uh, and in around her PhD time in France. She worked at Gemalto on the verification of uh, Java card sorts of things. And she's uh, uh, more famously been part of the, the SEL4 uh, verified project, uh, which I see she's wearing that T-shirt. Yes. Uh, yeah. uh, and um, uh, there she's worked on, uh, on C verification, the, like the C side going from the, um, uh, from the specs using, uh, using Isabel. Uh, one thing that's very important in this field is the, the maintenance of proofs and, um, and verified software, which our community does not know enough about. And she's been involved in that, and in particular, making some measurements of, of what what seems to matter, and how do how do proofs go, and what um, I mean, what do you see in the maintenance mm -hmm. phase? Um, and uh, she has um, uh, uh, many distinct distinctions, and one uh, is the MIT uh, um, what's it called Technology Reviews mm -hmm. um, uh, TR um, thirty five, which is the um, uh, um, what are, what's it called? Young innovators. Yeah, top 35 innovators of, top young of, uh, innovators. <laughs> that's right. And the 35 <laughs> means uh, uh, less than 35 years of age. And, um, uh, and today she's going to talk about uh, projects uh, going forward and yep. in uh, that group. So welcome. Cool. Thank you very much for this very thorough introduction. <laughs> uh, so um, thank you, everyone. Thank you for um, hosting me here as well. It's a pleasure to be able to present a bit of the recent work we've been uh, working on and also know a little bit more of the work um, going on here. Um, so yeah, I'm part of the Twirthworthy system group in what is now called Data61. So generally speaking, the Twirthworthy system group is aiming at providing high assurance um, OS code. And by high assurance, we mean uh, formal mathematical proofs uh, about correctness and security properties. Um, the, the, the work I'm going to present now is a bit of a more recent uh, work that, where we look at the challenge of interrupts in OS code. So um, most of verified uh, operating system, including SCL4, um, will run OS code with interrupts off, which means that the execution is um, completely sequential. Um, here we're looking at OS code that needs to run with interrupts on, uh, for um, uh, real-time capabilities, and this means that we need some kind of concurrency reasoning in there. So, more specifically, uh, we are targeting a small real-time embedded OS, which is called the Kronos, that is um, developed um, in our group in conjunction with uh, another um, company. And it is uh, mainly uh, commercially used in medical devices, uh, but also we have a DARPA-funded project um, called Hackums, uh, where uh, with several partners here in the US, we embed it into um, a flying drone, a flying quadcopter. Um, that's the research vehicle. We're also working with Boeing on a real helicopter running that. And what is common about that is it's basically very constrained hardware with no memory protection, no dual mode execution. Um, so the code is um, uh, tightly linked to the application code. Yes? Uh, I have a naive question. Yes. How can you even have OS code that runs with interrupts off? How will, that, how will the machine then interact with all the peripherals? So, um, for instance, in, in SEL4, you have a very limited number of well-identified preemption points for the long-running operations but all the rest is very fast code. You don't spend much time in the kernel. So the kernel uh, between a system call and an ex uh, exit, is uh, there is very limited time inside the kernel. And so for those uh, very limited long running operations like, um, um, like deleting things, then you would have very specific preemption point where you can um, reason about them like 
with uh, specific specification. Yeah. When, the, when the interrupt happens, something else is running. The OS is not running. Is it what is running at that point? Application code is running? So interrupts are on during application code, but as soon as you do a system call, you switch off interrupts. Uh, I see. Okay, now I and then when you exit the kernel, then so that's for CL4. And for most of um, yeah, verified OSs. Um, yeah. OK. Um, so, the, so the main thing here is we have very constrained hardware. And because of um, ensuring very low latency, we run with interrupts on. So it is um, interruptible uh, uh, OS code, including actually during the scheduling operations. So you don't switch interrupts even when you do the, the scheduling operations. Uh, on the other hand, the concurrency is still quite limited. We're still on a single core machine, so we're not doing uh, multi-core where you have uh, parallel execution on different cores. Um, and to be precise, the scheduling um, happening is also uh, preemptive, uh, which complicates also the interleaving between OS code, application code, and interrupt code. Um, but I'll come back to that in a bit more detail. But basically, that's what we want to verify. Um, an embedded OS that is interruptible, uh, single core with preemptive uh, multi-thread scheduling. All right, so that's for the, the target. Uh, the approach that we'll be using is um, actually a foundational concurrency method uh, that is conceptually quite simple. So because the concurrency that we're having is quite limited, but on the other hand, it is on shared viable that are highly shared and not um, locked when accessed. Um, we first don't need a, a completely new um, complex formalism, but we went for a conceptually simple shared viable reasoning framework. Um, so we went for a wiki grease. Um, on the other hand, a wiki grease was um, developed about 40 years ago for um, um, basically pen and paper proofs of protocols like concurrency protocols or concurrency algorithms. And, um, from that to um, operating system, there's still a gap. And plus, a wiki grease is quite well known to uh, be, have an explosion of proof obligations. Um, and so what we do is that we combine that with, um, first of all, we're going to uh, add a bit on the framework to be able to limit the concurrencies happening. What, what I um, said is that the concurrency is still limited in our framework. So we're going to uh, uh, instrument a wiki grease to model that. But we're also going to use modern theorem proving techniques, in our case, Isabel, uh, using the theorem prover Isabel Hall, um, for the proof to be machine checked, but also for uh, using a lot of the automation from Isabel to discharge a lot of the proof obligation that a wiki grease would generate. So, in a nutshell, that's it. So, we want to verify Ikronos using some kind of an extension or adaptation of wiki grease and with the help of Isabel Hall for the proofs. Uh, just to be clear before starting, when I say um, proven, so we have done a formal proof of a model of Ikronos so far. Um, so compared to SCL4, so where we've already, you know, like done the proof down to the binary level. At this stage, we're looking at the model level, and um, but we do it in a framework that will allow to do refinement as the next step. That's what we're looking at now, so that you don't be disappointed at the end that we're not having a proof at the binary level yet. Okay. So this talk, um, first I'm going to explain in a bit more detail what we want to model, how the interleaving execution works in an uh, uh, ikronos based system. Um, then I'll present two of the main uh, bodies of work that we're um, doing. First is how we model this interleaving formally between the application code, the scheduler, the interrupt handlers uh, in a wiki grease. And secondly, how we do the proof of correctness using uh, a model. So the model is to start with quite generic, and then we instantiate to Ikronos. And then we do a proof of correctness of the scheduling behavior of Ikronos, which is quite high level. We, keep, we only model the things that uh, matter for the uh, you know, scheduling behavior. And the main property we're proving for Ikronos is that um, the runnest task is always the highest priority runnable task, which is one of the main properties that Ikronos needs to ensure. Um, in, on the model side, I said we, we adapted a wiki grease with uh, a proof framework around it. Uh, one of them we called a weight painting that I'll explain, which is the way we restrict the interleaving possible in a wiki grease. And to do that, we have also an explicit model of the API of the hardware that does taking an interrupt, returning for an interrupt, actually controlling this interleaving. 
Uh, on the Isabel side, uh, we have a little bit of a proof framework, but also some proof engineering techniques that typically would make a wiki grease practical for such a, a case study and, and, and proof. All right, so let's start with the interleaving execution. So again, um, uh, Ikronos is uh, a small embedded OS. It's actually more like a library because it, it, it runs, um, as I said, on, on uh, quite constrained hardware. So it's more like a library of API function. Um, it allows the application code to be organized as tasks, which are basically uh, reactive loops um, that um, uh, perform a specific cohesive set of actions. Um, and the task can call to the uh, API for synchronization, like semaphores, mutexes, and stuff like that, or just signals. And the other big job of the OS is to provide the scheduler. So to provide a way to determine which task should be running. And that's why one of the main property for the correctness of Ikronos would be that the scheduler does its job properly, which means that whatever the policy is, the scheduling policy, in the variant we're looking at is um, based on priority. That's why the, the, the property is that the highest priority is running. But whatever that is, the job of the scheduler is to ensure that at any given point in time, the task that is running is the one that should be running according to the policy. OK. Yeah. Did most of this code exist before you started verifying it, or have you developed it as part of doing the verification? Um, so the code for um, Ikronos exists, so it's not like a CL4, which we had a co-development between the a co development of the code and the proof. So um, the code exists, although we there are many variants of it, and some of our engineers are involved in making that code evolving. Um, and at the at this point in time, we're not doing implementation verification, which is where in a CL4 we had a lot of interaction with the programmers to be able to adapt the code for uh, verification, uh, um, to make verification easier or, yeah. So um, it's, it's quite possible. So we, we're in quite collaboration with the people developing it. So it's quite possible that when we would reach the implementation verification, there would be some choices that we would have to negotiate with them if we could adapt the code. But it's true that for SCL4, it's quite known that it had been made possible we could, because we, we didn't have a static, completely fixed code base. Yeah. Even at the modeling level, they, they would not be happy if you disabled interrupts for, for all of the... Yes, exactly. So, so there is, I mean, um, in that sense, we tried, we, we model something that is uh, um, realistic from a system point of view. Um, uh, on the other hand, we haven't had any um, or yet any verification push to change anything to make, I don't know, verification possible. I mean, obviously, yes, if we would switch the interrupts, yes, that would be one choice, but that was the challenge we wanted to tackle for it. Uh, all right. Um, so, yeah, so typically tasks um, would be in, in three different kind of states. Either you're the currently running task, only one in single core, um, then you could get blocked if, for instance, you decide to wait on the signal. And uh, once you unblock, you come back to a pool of runnable set. So the pool of runnable set is really what is important. It's any time this would be changed, this is where the scheduler should be called. Because this means that at some point you have added something here that could be of higher priority than the currently running task. And so you should stop the currently running task to run the, the one that is higher here. Um, so by describing what I just said, this means that the scheduling is preemptive. So we don't wait for the application to decide to release um, the CPU, but um, the scheduler can decide at any given point in time that there is highest priority running, uh, uh, runnable, available, and therefore to stop the current task. I'm going to go into the interleaving in a bit more detail just in the next slide. But um, so um, the last thing that happens is the interrupts. So your, um, your system would react to some interrupts that are defined at configuration. And so the programmer defines some handlers, one for each interrupt. And these handlers, so again, is code provided by um, the programmer. And it can call a limited set of the API functions. So typically, the handlers would do uh, what I would call local computation. So, you know, like some kind of copying buffers and stuff like that from hardware to software, um, which we at the moment abstract away from because it doesn't have any influence on the um, uh, scheduling. But 
it can do some operations that uh, will influence the scheduling, in particular uh, sending signals. So if there is some kind of interrupt that should wake up or unblock some of the tasks that are waiting for that, then it would call the signal um, send API and that would potentially unblock uh, a task and therefore would influence this, the scheduling. All right, so um, just a side note, um, the, again, the variant of Ikronos that we're targeting is running on an ARM platform. Um, the only thing that really matters for our model is that it um, introduces a new uh, interesting things for the interleavings that interrupts can be nested. So interrupts can interrupt each other and actually it can only do so according to a policy. So an interrupt can interrupt another interrupt. That's a lot of interrupts. Um, only if it has a high priority. Okay. Um, so this is just to say that we are in a setting where um, most of the interesting challenges are present. So how does it really look like in terms of interleaving? If we have two tasks, A and B, um, the first interesting case that is the f just the simplest one is that in application code, an interrupt can happen at any time. So the hardware would stop that execution, switch to the interrupt handler, execute the handler. Mm -hmm. And this is where the handler might uh, potentially do an operation, an, an API operation that would unblock a task. And therefore, when we finish the handler, um, this is where the execution should not come back to B because this potentially have, uh, um, should unblock maybe task A, for instance, so the scheduler should be called. So at the end of the handler, the scheduler should be called, which in this case is, con is considered in a different execution context, so it's its own um, execution context here. And then the scheduler just checks the runnable uh, set and would um, pick a next task. Uh, so in this case, it would preempt the running application task. So application code is interruptible and it's also preemptible. It could be uh, stopped in its execution. Um, here I represent then uh, a function call. So um, I present it in green, which kind of represents the OS code. So at some point the task can um, decide to call a function of the API like um, locking a mutex or taking a semaphore and acquiring a semaphore. And the main difference here is that interrupts are on while we do that. So in a CL4, you would switch interrupts off as you take the system call. Um, and um, so that again goes to the interrupt handler, which may uh, require the scheduler to run. The main difference between application code being interrupted and OS code being interrupted is that um, we would still go back to the OS code to finish the API function and the scheduler would only be delayed at the end of the, um, the uh, OS code execution. And so there is a special mechanism at the end of the handler that um, checks did I interrupt application code or OS code. If it's application, I go back to the scheduler. Otherwise, I go back to the previous task. And only at the end, there is a mechanism that checks um, that if there was something requested, the scheduler requested, then I would switch to the scheduler. Um, just a particular case of that, an instantiation of that case, is during the scheduler interrupts are on as well. So while you're deciding which one is next to run, you might have a handler running as well. So that's a specific case of the other one. So in both these cases, the OS code, including scheduler, is interruptible, but it's not preemptible. You go back to the to the um, <coughs> to finishing the execution before switching to the the scheduler. So is your yeah. is your goal to verify the green scheduler for any code in the yellow and the blue? Yes. So the goal is that for um, for any so if we model this. We want to show that at any given point in time where you reach this yellow code, you're the one that should be running. So basically, you didn't forget to call the scheduler when you had to call it. And the scheduler has been able to execute in a way that when it takes that decision, you go back to the task that was the highest right. in the runnable. So the yellow code can be completely arbitrary. Yes, sorry, yes, correct. So and we abstract. The blue code can be completely arbitrary. Yes, so okay. the blue code, um, on, so in the blue code, we only model if it calls an API function. So we model the blue code as being doing anything arbitrary and potentially changing the runnable, the signals, so the events, all right? But otherwise, yes, we abstract away from the things that are specific to the application. All right, so this was like the multiple cases. Oh yeah, the thing that I was just saying that interrupts can be interrupted themselves. So you, you also have this, this case here. Okay, 
So this is what we want to model. How we modeled it is what I'm going to present now. Um, so our approach was to actually just consider a, um, a concurrency setting uh, where we would put all the code in parallel, although it doesn't happen in parallel. So we, we put it in parallel and then we instrument it in a way that we restrict the interleaving to where it actually happens. So to allow full concurrency, we just use a wiki grease, which just means that this parallel composition is the standard parallel composition where um, if you're executing one statement, the next statement can be any one in the, in the parallel composition. Um, and then restriction is what we call the await painting, and I'll come back to that in a minute. So first I'll, I'll just... Um, so how many of you are familiar with Wikigrease, or should I? Yeah, okay, so I'll just uh, explain. So Wikigrease is the um, uh, first and most simple extension of uh, whole logic for uh, parallel programs. So, Actually, yeah. Leslie Lampard would object to that statement. <laughs> okay, it yes. It has caused a lot of confusion. Right. His opinion, and I agree with him, is that it's an extension of Floyd's original system right. to uh, parallel programs rather than whole logic. Okay, so it's an, all right. Um, well, you can okay. That's all right. Yeah, yeah, all right. That's okay. That was just a comment. Okay. <laughs> it doesn't matter. I'll, I'll, I'll take that in my notes and try to um, change my the, that's, the, that's the description of it. Thanks. <laughs> Which I happen to agree with. Um, so, but basically, um, whole whole slash foil logic uh, allow you to describe, you know, like prove a post condition from a precondition for a program that has a certain. Um, uh, kind of syntax and semantic. And what a wiki grease would add is basically two constructs to that um, type of programs. One is the parallel composition, which um, the semantic I just described, you just non deterministically pick one of them and execute its current instruction. And for um, the second construct, it's an await statement. So the await statement is a way to synchronize those parallel programs. And it just executes that condition only when that Boolean guard is true. So it's a way to um, synchronize, so to wait on something to be true to be able to execute that, that program. So these are the two new constructs. And as we know, in um, whole logic, you have a verification condition generator. And why it is more complicated for Wikigrease, it's simply that whenever you had a, a program in whole logic and then you would generate like primitive uh, statement that just um, infers what are the intermediate assertions, when you put something in parallel, you suddenly have interference. So you have to show that anything that is in parallel doesn't violate what is here. So after you have executed C1, you have established P2 locally. And um, at this stage, if you put something in parallel, then you could violate P2 when you start the next instruction locally. So what a wiki Gris, um, uh proposes is basically showing first local correctness, so as you would do in normal whole logic, but then you show inference freedom, which means that you annotate fully your whole program, and then every statement in a parallel program should be shown not to violate any of the assertions that you have used for your local correctness. So that's why you have the um, state explosion, uh, uh, proof obligation explosion, because basically you have a quadratic um, number of verification condition to prove. Um, and it requires a fully annotated program. So in our case, we don't, so we're going to first restrict that concurrency. We don't have full concurrency. There are only some points where it can happen. And so this is what we're going to instrument now. And we're also going to use Isabel then to discharge a lot of the proof obligation that are just um, trivially um, contradictory because you can't be at those two places at the same time. Uh, we actually use a formalization, an existing formalization of a wiki grease in Isabel that has done by uh, Leono Prenza Nieto in 2002, and which is in the Isabel distribution, um, standard distribution. So we're just going to extend on that. Uh, so as I said, once, once you do that and you put the parallel composition, then you have way too much interleaving. So what we want is to say, well, actually, concurrency only happen at the points where an interrupt handler can start. So when I'm executing anywhere in code A, I can't execute, the next instruction can't be something in code B, but it can, it can be the first instruction of one of the handlers. And when I put code here, by the way, um, I just mean a model of the program that represents that, but I'm not at the instruction level, as I said. Okay, so what is this await painting? So in a wiki Greece, we don't actually have a notion of task, like it's implicit, we don't have them as first citizens. So we have to be able to talk 
about what a task is. So we introduce a variable um, AT for the active task. And here, task is both application task, but also the scheduler or the handler. So AT represents um, who of those programs uh, is executing. And then we await paint all, most all the statement. Await paint just means that every program is guarded by an instruction saying AT equals me. So if I'm in code A, I have this uh, AT equals A and AT equals B and B. So you can see here that this completely removes all interleaving. So I suddenly you have sequential execution until I have an explicit assignment of AT. So if suddenly one of these instructions would be like if, if you were in cooperative scheduling, you could have one here that says AT equals B. I release my, um, I just want to switch to B. And then you would, you, so we would explicitly see where the interleaving happens. Um, and where is add modified here, the add variable? So, so far not. Oh, okay. Right. Yes. And so then we provide, so AT should be only changed by um, not the code, it doesn't exist in the code, but by the OS functions that may modify it, including the scheduler. So the scheduler and the interrupt, uh, taking interrupts, okay? So when you take interrupts, when you return from interrupt, or when you do a context switch, that's are the three cases where you would change the, uh, the AT. And this is what I call, you know, like uh, a hardware API model. So we now can describe precisely what it is doing. Um, we assume that the code would not... Uh, uh, the application code would not um, change or uh, call those context switching without going th through the OS API. Um, we could prove it if we were not in a like in a setting like a CL4 where everything goes through the kernel, but because we don't have manual protection, we have to assume it. But we can check that statically on the application code. Um, and so, apart from those um, those instructions, everything else then would be um, sequential. And um, well, of course, we don't do that manually. Like we have a command await pane that does it for all of the code. And actually, we don't have to assume uh, that we have only two or three. Uh, I don't have to basically hand wave saying that two is equal to n. Um, so we actually can talk about n things. So we have just a construct that comes from the existing um, formalization where we say we have n tasks. So we have n application tasks. They're all in infinite loop. And we were given the code by the programmer. This could be including API functions. Um, and then we await painted. So I showed that for the application code, which in the application code, yes, you don't have any switching. And so now for the whole thing, so this is the application code that I've just shown. And for the, the scheduler and the interrupt is almost similar, apart from the fact that you encapsulate it between taking the interrupt and returning from the interrupt. And that's what I'll, I'll, I will present now. So if you note here, the only thing that is not await painting would be taking those interrupts. This means that this is the only place where the interleaving will really happen automatically with the a weak degree. So a weak degree will guarantee that uh, everything will be sequential apart from potentially non-deterministically picking that instruction. Um, so that's our model of interleaving. And now I'm going to present what is I take and I return. This is Actually, what, I, yeah. I, I'm still puzzled that yeah. variable, what was that called, add? Yes, AT. Where is that mod variable going to be modified so here? here, uh, in I take, in it I return. It can only I be will... modified in I take and I return. Yes. Uh, and in the scheduler. The scheduler sometimes? And in the scheduler. I'm going to show it, yeah. Okay. So basically, we provide um, three ways of changing it. I take, I return, and a context switch in... Uh, function that can be um, called by the scheduler. Mm -hmm. Yeah? And then all the await paint, just to remind you, this just says AT, wait for AT to be equal to H. So one yeah. of the values of that variable, special variable, is each task ID. Yes. Then one of them is the ID of the scheduler. Yes. And one of them for Correct. each handler. Correct. I see. Yes. Okay. And so because you have, for instance, all the code here, if I have three instruction, if I'm executing current instruction, I can't suddenly switch to somewhere else in the handler. The only thing ca that can happen is that I would switch to the top of one of the handlers. Mm. OK? So I'll just pretend I take and I return just now. Um, hopefully, it's going to get a bit clearer. So yeah, so the, this model, you have to 
show how you take the scheduler, the return, and the take. Um, I'll just show the take and the return. I can uh, discuss the scheduler um, separately if you want to, but just for time reasons, I'll, I'll just show the two ones. Um, so, I take um, is really this non-deterministic taking of an interrupt. Uh, so, the first um, naive way of seeing it is just AT equals H. So, at any given point in time, AT can be switched. The only thing that we need to be careful is that um, you, there are ways of switching off interrupts, right? So, you still need to be sure that the interrupt is not masked. So, the application code could switch off interrupts if they wanted to, and then um, um, you can't take the interrupt. So, you still have an await statement here that describes the fact that in the hardware, you can't take an interrupt if it's masked. Um, and so, the, so, we add a new variable, which is EI, inter, uh, enabled interrupts. And um, you can only do the uh, switching to the handler if this handler is in the enabled interrupts. Um, it is an await statement, but it's not the general await painting things that we were doing. It's much more permissive. So you can have that at the same time that you're executing task A. This can be um, true at the same time. Um, it's because we have nested interrupts. Actually, the can interrupt is a bit more complicated. Oh, first of all, yeah, we have also to remember while we update the um, task, what was the task. So you, you put it on a stack. And it is a stack because um, you could be nested again. So you have to remember what was the previous task. OK. And the can interrupt, I said, was a little bit more complicated. I'll just put the two. Um, first of all, if you are a handler that has been interrupted, you can't take that interrupt again, right? Because you are, the handler is being interrupted. So you can only take it if you are enabled and you're not already suspended waiting to finish. Um, and as I said, there's sometimes also in the hardware some kind of policy that says some interrupts can't uh, interrupt others. So only if you can interrupt the currently. Um, so this basically, these two aspects are really because of the nested interrupts. But you can ignore them if you don't have nested interrupts. Um, so that's it. So that's how you model I take. And that's our um, representation of what we understand the hardware is doing when taking an interrupt. And this is what we've been discussing with the systems guy to uh, ensure that this is uh, really what would happen. Um, and then for the return from interrupt, as I said, on the easy case, you basically just change AT to take the scheduling, the, to take the scheduler. Um, but as I said, this is only one case. So uh, if you remember, I said, well, there are two cases. If, and this should be if I'm in the OS code or application code. If I'm in application code, then I go back to the scheduler. If I'm on an OS code, I should just go back to the previous task, OK? So I just pop the stack and, and go back to what the head of AT was, OK? And uh, the way we decide, are we in application code or are we in OS code, the way it is done in Ikronos is that every API function that may uh, change something for the scheduler, might change a, a call, call some, some um, you know, um, context switching, or might influence the scheduling decisions, you switch off, as I said, the scheduler. So that when you come back to the, from the handler, you know that you have to go back to OS code. And the way it is done is that the scheduler is considered a bit like an interrupt, a software interrupt. And so you just disable it the same way you would disable an interrupt. Okay? So every time you enter OS code, you would disable the scheduler by putting it out of the enable interrupts. And then when you return from an interrupt, the only thing that the handler will do instead of calling the scheduler is saying, I request the scheduler. So whenever you have, so you have an extra variable that is scheduler requested. And only if the scheduler is requested and the scheduler is enabled, meaning I'm in application code, then I would call the scheduler straight away. Otherwise, I will just go back to the previous task and finish. Uh, so I'm not presenting the, how we take that, but basically this is uh, where you would look at is the scheduler request, has, be, has the scheduler been requested, which means that OS code has been interrupted, but hasn't been handled yet. Um, and therefore, I would switch on the scheduler again here 
and switch to it to be able to handle it. OK. Um, so that's more or less um, the model until, uh, until living. This is the generic part. I'll sh just show in a minute how we, what is specific to Ikronos. But from a generic point of view, we have uh, an interleaving with the a wiki gris plus a weight painting and a few API functions to enable and disable the scheduler and take um, take and return from interrupt. So I'm, I'm yeah. just curious about your language, your modeling language. How yes. You, what's, what does it look like? So the modeling language is basically the um, simple while loop, uh, while program, programming language that I showed uh, when I showed a wiki gris plus parallel composition and a weight statement. I so, if your question is about granularity, parser, type checker, and all that, and then you compile it somehow, the so, PC generation to Isabel, is that how it is? So, um, the language itself is already written in Isabel. I'm pretty sure that your your next question is granularity, or no, something no, no, like I, or atomicity. I, I'm just, I, I've heard so much about the SEL 14. Yes. And I, I, all I know about it is that there's some Isabel thing going on there. Okay. I want to see concretely what program, what program development looks like. What is the syntax that the programmer is confronted with? Okay, so um, maybe I'll take that question at the end. Yes. But basically, okay. in a CL4, you have the C program that is translated into Isabel. And then, yes, you have a C parser that takes the C program, translate it into and a, a deep embedding of uh, imperative programs inside Isabel. So you have a formalization of your C program inside Isabel. And then you have a high level specification that is basically a high level uh, functional uh, representation of what the program is supposed to do. And then you have a refinement proof. And then we have a different story down to the binary. What I'm doing here is basically working at this level. I just assume that I have a high level while language. Uh, the the Ikronos code is written in Isabel, is, uh, is written in C. And eventually, if we do refinement, what we want to do now is we're going to translate that C into Isabel using the same C parser and then do some kind of refinement, but with the concurrency uh, aspect that we have to care about um, atomicity. That's why I thought your question was linked to that. Because at the high level, I just say I have one instruction and this is what happens. And at the bottom, I might have 10 instructions and I need to show that it refines properly with respect to concurrency. Yeah? yeah Does it answer a little bit? Atomicity at lunch. OK, oh, yeah. that sounds good. <laughs> the translation is part yes. of the trusted code base. The, the translation from C to Isabel is part of the trusted code in, base. In, in SCL4, it used to be. It's not anymore because we go down to the binary. So initially, the first uh, big result for functional correctness was from C to, ab to abstract specification. Um, this assumed uh, both the translation and the compiler correct. Now that we have uh, compilation down to binary, the trusted uh, is reduced to translating the binary into whole fourth using the Cambridge um, translation, which is much more straightforward and which much less uh, uh, possibility for uh, misinterpretation, yeah. I have one other quick question. The programmer who writes the code, yes. he, the verified code, that programmer is writing in C? In which, in Ikrono? Uh, in both no, it's in C. SCL4. Yes. So the, 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 the interaction with the prover, so to speak, is at the level of the C syntax. Is that yes, correct? Yes. Um, yes. So the we, preconditions and post conditions are also added to no. C? Um, the it, the post condition and precondition are written directly in Isabel. In the oh, I see. So so the when the programmer the programmer writes code in C. Yes. And then he writes specifications in Isabel. Yes. So he needs to he or she needs to know that this piece of C code will be translated into such and such a name yeah. in Isabel, so that he can refer to it in Isabel. Well, yeah. I mean, this kind I of see. a standard. Okay. There are a few things that are. So there was, uh, we, we, uh, with, the, with the maintenance, I don't know how much we're going to do that, but there was a stage where we would actually start writing in Haskell and then writing in C. And then the Haskell was the intermediate level between the C and the abstract specification. Um, the abstract specification is really what describes what the program is doing. So it's, it's, it's a, a little bit more detailed than 
pre and post. You could consider it like a, uh, how they call it, like full specification, like pre and post can be quite abstracted away, right? So uh, it's a full description uh, at the abstract level. But yeah, if you want to verify a new function, like that we're doing now, right? SEL4 evolves, and so when you want to write a new function, you write its abstract spec in Isabel. Ideally, you would first write it in Haskell, and you would just check first that the Haskell, the design correspond to your spec. Then you write it very optimizedly in C, translate into Isabel under your refinement proof. Yeah, I'll ask so, you more later. Sure, yeah. Okay. Um, it, is, it is not the same kind of uh, integrated model, uh, integrated development uh, for verification program that you would do for something like uh, Daphne, where you write your specs as a pre and post, or things like Pharmacy or things like that, where you write your pre and your post, or Java stuff like as well, print post in the program. But in that, it's quite hard to write a full abstract functional specification of a system. You usually write things per function, not for a full system. So for instance, the really nice thing about having an abstract spec is then you can prove properties about it. So the key thing, like what I'm doing now, you wouldn't, like the property that I'm going to express, the, the environment property, uh, uh, would be harder to just put as pre and post inside your, your directly at your C level. No, I, and I, same I, thing for the, the security properties about cell 4. So, no, I agree with that. Yeah. Uh, I, I was just trying to get an understanding of what is the programmer's mental model? So when I write program in C sharp, and I'm not trying to write any verified program, yeah. I have to deal with the type checker of C sharp, right? Yeah. There's a mental model of what the compiler is going to do when it generates executable code. Yeah. I'm trying to figure out what is that mental model when one is doing verified software development in your group? What are the kinds of tools that people use and how they orchestrate so, those tools? Uh, okay, I might take that at the end because then I'll, I'll yeah, finish yeah, that yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. But typically we have two, two teams working together, the kernel people and the verification people. Some of them are in between, like they do both. But typically we would have kernel people writing the code and then verification people uh, they, uh, adding the, the, the talking to, to these guys to do the abstract specification and then, and then doing the proofs. Yeah. Okay, so I'll just... Um, uh, finish that a little bit. So I said this is quite generic. So now uh, code A scheduler. So the scheduler is really what we need to describe now for any specific things like eChronos. So what is the scheduler really doing? For the handlers and the, the application, it is generic in what they do for what is application specific. But when I call an API function, this is actually part of code A here. Okay. So for eChronos, what I have to do is that I have to um, describe what those um, code are. So I just show the scheduler and the handler here. So the handler, for instance, we don't show again the local computation, but we show we have two main variables that are in, of uh, importance for the scheduling property: the R, which has the runnable set that I described, and the E, which are the events um, that are um, the things that the that will change when you call a, a signal, right? So. A handler would raise an event to say, um, uh, I need to um, uh, unblock a task. And so what the only thing we model about handlers is that they may change the events, and then they request the scheduling. Okay, And then they may do local computation that we don't model here. What the scheduler is doing is basically picking the next task. So it, uh, it would handle the event, so it would update the runnable depending on what the events were. We save it before because this is interruptible, so you could have an interrupt changing E at the, at the same time. Um, and then you call the scheduling policy, which is kept quite generic here. So this is what would, um, so we're not proving the scheduling pro policy being or algorithm would be correct, but more the, the interleaving. And then you would switch to that um, task. Um, and again, I'm not showing the code A, but what code A is doing is either application tasks that are abstracted away or potentially calling an API function that will change this, that will request the scheduling, like yielding or um, actually same thing like changing events. Okay, so now assume that this is the model part. How do I prove a property about it? What, ha what do we have proved so far? As I said, we proved that the running task is always the highest priority task, runnable task. Um, so this is the English version. How do we translate that into our formalization? 
So if we remember that, if I take the point of view of one task running, it means that every time I'm in the orange code here, which means application is running, then if I would run the scheduler now, it would pick me. Meaning that there is nothing that has happened in the runnable task that would pick someone else and that I haven't handled somehow. Uh, meaning that if I'm here and I'm not supposed to be the one running, it means that there is a highest priority task that is prevented from running, which is bad for real time. Um, OK. So what we have in a wiki grease is a way to describe that a post condition is reached. Um, yes? So it, that, that's not true. The running test right. sometimes is not good. So you, do, shouldn't there be an unless there? Unless what? Unless I'm in the system call? So that's what I mean by, um, um, so you're right. So when with the running application task, which we described as when I'm in when user, with, code, is, user, user code, code is actually code running, is running outside of voice code. So correct. Okay. So um, we, you'll see in the formalization that this is exactly what we say. Um, yeah. But the first thing is, so, so far we have uh, pre and post, and we have actually infinite loops. So the post condition is never reached. We don't care about the post condition. What we really care about is an environment. Um, the environment is just, I remember, like C is a parallel program that is fully annotated. So environment is just putting it in annotations. But it would be nicer to have a way to just describe the environment independently, right? But that's um, the first thing we have done. Um, but the other thing, more importantly, for making this scale is the environment, as every environment, would rely on many other smaller environments about many of the data structures that you're manipulating. The problem is that if, so what you're really proving is something like that. The problem is that this means that you have to put all the correct annotations in here to be able to prove them, to put all of them. And this doesn't really scale. And moreover, maybe I needs I9, but maybe I9 doesn't need any of the other ones. And so you would like to prove I9 separately. So that's the first thing we've done is um, add, add actual syntax to be able to talk about invariant separately. And then uh, we add support to assuming invariant to be able to prove them separately. And so we have this um, compositionality lemma where we say, that if you want to prove two invariants and that one might not depend on the other, then you might prove I prime separately, and then you can put all the assertions here that only talk about uh, or are needed for I prime, and then you can forget about those assertions and then uh, prove your actual big invariant just assuming that um, helper invariant. Um, there is a merge here that just means that the, the programs are the same, but you merge all the annotations. So that here you have actually all the merge annotation, but you didn't have to write them by hand. Um, this is this is like it is like a simple modus ponens kind of of, of uh, rule, but it's critical to the proof itself, and we'll see you how because we had we, we talked about um, state um, sorry proof obligation explosion right a lot of proof obligations, and and then we want to use Isabel simplifier automation to discharge a lot of them, but. If those proof obligations are very complicated because you have all these distinctions and you don't know which one you need to which for that, then the simplifier would explore too much state. So it's quite important to be able to decompose it first before using automation. So now that we have that, we can state the, pro the theorem that we've proved. So the theorem that we've proved is this one, um, is meaning that um, under no precondition, like true, uh, the Ikronos system, which is defined as this full interleaving of application code, scheduler, and handler code, um, preserves that scheduler environment at each assertion level. Uh, so at every single assertion, the in, uh, scheduler environment is true. What the scheduler environment means, and I'll, uh, this means that, uh, come back to your question just now, if AT, the active task, is a user task, so I'm not in the scheduler, I'm not in the handler code, and I am in application code, so meaning I'm not in OS code, and I describe this by saying the scheduler is enabled, because I, like remember we disable scheduler here and we re enable here. Okay, so when I have the scheduler enabled, then if I would run the scheduling policy with the current E and the current R, then it would pick me, meaning there hasn't been any change here that have been forgotten and have and, and would pick someone else if we called it here. So, yes? So, if you had a bug in one of the interrupt handlers that uh, returns to the application and yes. never called the scheduler, yes. Um, so how, how would this property be violated, or is that? 
Well, the property would be violated because the handler would have changed E. And if you had run the scheduler, the, the, the E would have uh, unblocked the handler. The handle event just looks at E and says, oh, E was meant to go to A, and A should be now unblocked. So I'm going to unblock A. So A comes into R. And so if I call the scheduling policy on that new updated set, I would say that the current task is A. But the handler went back to B because it didn't call the scheduler. So you would be in task B running, but if you would check what the scheduler would have said, it would have said A. So you, that's, that's exactly the case, right? But if the bug forgets to remove sched from EI, then it would. So that's, okay, so that's an in interesting point. So this means that we rely on the OS, every OS API function to disable scheduler and re-enable scheduler or, uh, um, wrapping around every API function. And this is, this is something then that when we do refinement, we have to show that every OS function indeed verify that. So in, in the code A that I haven't shown, I said every API function looks like this. And looks like this means it starts by switching off scheduler, then it, it updates E or R, and then it re-enables scheduling. If I do the refinement, I can show that this, if some API function don't do that, then the refinement will not hold, although the property would hold. Does it make sense? Yeah. OK, so how we proved it? Uh, we use the, the compositionality lemma, as I said. So we have a bunch of helper lemma that we prove separately. Um, as I said, there are about nine of them. And just to give you a flavor, one of them, for instance, would um, talk about the stack and say that when I look at the stack, the bottom of the stack is always a user. So these are the kind of uh, typical data structure environment that you need, but that you don't want to add all the assertions for that into the assertions you really need about your big invariant uh, for the scheduling. So that's why it's nice to be able to prove them separately. But then for all of them, we'll end up with this kind of lemma. So either proving the scheduler invariant or proving one of the helper invariants. And that's where really the proof work starts. Okay, So you have done compose everything. You have all your lemmas, how you prove that. So um, this is the moment where you say, oh, does a wiki grease work or not? <laughs> so you run the VCG. And this indeed creates a quite large number of sub-goals. Um, and then um, we define uh, uh, a kind of custom tactic that uses the simplifier, but adds a few specific lemmas that uh, be able to discharge the one, basically the one that are contradictory quite um, trivially. And you're back down quickly to 30 goals, which are the one that you really want to look at, because these are the ones where the interesting things are. And typically, you would. As, remember, you have to put annotations for this to go through, right? So typically, then you go back into a loop and you add annotations that allow you to prove those remaining sub goals. And what we actually do instead of proving them manually is that we add more um, things to the tactic so that then the proof is always in one step. Uh, so in the end, that's what happened, right? You, you do a few iterations and then you end up uh, putting more in your tactic and then you have um, zero sub goals. Whereas the issue is timing. It takes about 90 seconds just to generate the sub goals. And then it takes about an hour to wait for e simplifier to just discharge all of them. Why is the VC generation so, so slow? Um, so I'll come back to that. So um, it's, it's mainly the scale of it, like 200 lines. Like a, a lot of the Wikigris, even with the formalization in Isabel, have about two, three programs or even a parametric program and another program in parallel. And some of the, one of them would have like three lines or something like that. Oh, okay. When you have- It's just a quadratic thing going on there. Yes, exactly. Yes, okay, so you're okay. just generating all that. Yes, okay, it's yes. quite slow. Um, so we got a proof engineering on board, a great proof engineering that is going to join Dan and that is going to join soon uh, for an internship here um, that knows very well Isabel internals and uh, know how to tweak things. And so he did three things. The first of all uh, is uh, deduplication. So a lot of the sub goals are actually quite identical just because the, either the assertions is similar or the, the, um, the instruction that is maybe modifying them or violating them is, is identical as well. So you have a lot of duplication in the sub goals. So the only thing he did is just deduplicating that and not 
after generation. After generation could be done as well, but then you, you, you don't target the problem of the 90 seconds. So actually inside Isabel, he just um, remember what the proof has been, the proof obligation generated, and he doesn't regenerate it if it's similar. OK, so that's down to 1,000. Uh, but he also noticed that somehow there is some redundant computation for same sub goal. So the Oweki Greece VCG, the default one, for the same sub goal, we try uh, the same tactic or same method computation a few times. And so he did some memoization technique to be able to remember what worked last time on the same sub goal and just reapply it instead of regenerating or re uh, putting the simplifier on it. Uh, and this went down to about five seconds for generating, which is uh, much more reasonable for uh, proving. Uh, and, but this only went down to five to 30 minutes to, to generate those sub goals. And, and each time, I remember, right? It's interactive proof. We're not into like pressing a button waiting for the answer. And yeah. Does your uh, parallel wide language, does it have uh, procedure calls? No. So we don't have that. And that's actually a current uh, working project where we are adding um, this kind of framework of parallel composition weight statement at the formal C language I was talking about. So be able to have all the C feature uh, kind of language that is used for SCL4, but with parallel composition. But at this stage, we don't have that. Um, and so the last thing that, um, that Dan did was to um, have, so in Isabel, when you prove a lemma, you have a way to um, sorry it. So to just assume it as an axiom. And this is really useful when you do a proof and you need a helper lemma. So you define your helper lemma, you saw it, and you continue. Um, and this is really proof engineering technique. Like because we 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 handling like either large proof or proof that takes a long time, um, we need this kind of technique. So in, in SCL4, we have a lot of this kind of research on proof engineering because we are in a, a typical case of using Isabel where going from that stage when you change the proof and just going back to where you were before might take 30 minutes and you don't want to do that, right? So in this case, is another example of that, but just inside the same lemma. And so he would do the same technique, but at sub-goal level. So typically, if you have proved all the, I don't know, 900 previous sub-goals and you just want to change one assertion that is only for one sub-goal, you don't want to have to execute the whole tactic again. So it does some proof skipping for all of that. It is unsafe, like all the sorry proof, but basically you switch it off once you've done all your assertions and you're done with your proof. So once you've done all the interaction, you switch that off and check that it runs properly. Um, and yeah, and so this goes down to five to 30 seconds in the worst case, which makes now this practical. Um, all right, so running a bit late, but that's more or less what I wanted to talk about. So uh, we have, modeled something that is um, at the high level, the behavior of the uh, scheduler for Ikronos, with a lot of things that are quite generic that could be applied with different policy or, or different platform or um, different OS even. And then we have one um, instantiation of a proof uh, at this level. The next steps are uh, in a few directions. So as I said, down to code is obviously the first one. Like how, how do you make sure that this is actually what the scheduler is really doing when we have the implementation of the scheduler? Um, then how do we um, link to a more detailed API? So we had an initial uh, more detailed API. So here, Ikronos API is just described is in whether or not it changes the runnable. But then you might want to do much more detailed API for application code to be verified. So what does it mean to provide the user with a semaphore API function? What does this provide if you want to do a proof about it? Um, then, um, as I said, we have some assumptions on what um, the application code may do or the handler may do. So we could check that statically on, on a specific instantiation. Um, and the application code verification, that's what I, um, uh, I just mentioned. If you want to verify a specific application on top of Ikronos, uh, you would need that as a, uh, as a foundation. All right, that went a bit over what I was expecting, but with a lot of questions. So yeah, thank you. Yeah. More questions? Yes? Why do you call your organization Data61? <laughs> Next question. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Data61 is a merge between NICTA and one part of CSRO that uh, is a, a big research um, in science, science institute in Australia. Um, the common point between the two was something related to data. And 61, people say I should check another, like, it's a prime number. No, it's the area code for the phone for Australia. It's very it's very it's very it's a, it's a prime hexagonal number. It's a hexagonal number? Yeah. How is it hexagonal? It's a centered, uh, yeah, hexagonal. Um, There's a mathematical definition of it? Yeah, count the vertices in the, um, like the triangular numbers. This right, but for hexagons. Uh, well, almost, yeah, but it's centered. So uh, take the, the, the number of vertices in um, uh, concentric um, hexagons, not overlapping with the points. Then you get one times, one plus six times a triangle number, and 61 is one of those. Whoa. <laughs> so one of the reasons it creates a lot of discussions. I like that. <laughs> And did Cisco sue? Uh, For what? Cisco. what? Cisco. The Cisco logo. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Australia. It's, it's like Golden Gate Bridge. It's Australia's. Yeah. It's a map of. Aust it's supposed to represent a map of Australia. With Tasmania being the dot. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I see it. But ah, it yes. also looks like yeah. Golden Gate Bridge and Cisco. Yes. <laughs> Um, <laughs> the, um, in, uh, if, you, if you compare the, of course you're just starting this now, but if you compare it um, in, in effort to, I mean effort or, I don't know, number of source lines maybe, or effort yeah. to, the, to the scale of things, comparing it to, um, to SEL4, um, uh, is, it, is it about the same or much no, lower? No, much, much lower, less, much, much, much lower. So, we, um, so SEL4 uh, has been going on, okay, if I, if I stop... If I stop SEL4 when we had only done C to abstract, mm -hmm. it had been going on for four and a half years with the team going from seven to 12 people. This has been going on for a year and a half, two years, including a lot of initial just figuring out what, how to model things, concurrency, blah, blah, blah. And it involves mainly three people. So myself, Carol Morgan, who is a uh, concurrency professor, and, uh, and Corey Lewis, which is our proof engineer that is both proof engineer and um, uh, involved a lot in the OS uh, implementation. And then um, during the end, now we have Dan coming up, uh, on board and, and Christine as well, but it's much, much lower scale at the moment, yeah. So, but it's also less assurance at the moment, right? Yeah. So do you have a sense for how, how this would generalize to other concurrent settings? It seems like some of the model is very specific to this particular hardware. Around. So, um, so I think, um, so we have, for instance, a, another uh, starting project about how to um, extend the verification that has been done for cell four on a multi-core setting. Um, so in this case, uh, concurrency would be uh, fully uh, concurrent. <laughs> uh, but uh, kind of the general ideas of how to um, um, be able to model a controlled concurrency setting, because for instance, in the, the multi-core setting of SEL4, it's still, uh, so the, the OS people have been working on showing that a big lock around the kernel, um, as opposed to um, single uh, fine-grained locks inside the kernel, has not uh, so much overhead because you you spend very little time in the kernel. Again, it's very fast and stuff. And so this means that you could have a lot of the sequential proof that we had done that could be ported. It's still not exactly the same kernel. We have some complication because of multi-core because the user still runs um, concurrently. Um, so in that setting, you I mean, the general ideas and framework. Obviously, a lot of the, you know, return from interrupt and stuff like that are, are very specific. Um, if you just look at a single core with interrupts, I think there's quite a bit of um, things that could be reused but just tweaked, like in the way that if, if your return from interrupt is slightly different or if you have a different kind of policy or if you're, um, like, the, because it's quite high level at the moment, your, um, the way you handle OS functions. So I said that all OS functions actually start by disabling interrupt. Some of them, a very limited set, don't because they don't change 
the scheduling behavior. Um, but that would have to be checked. So for instance, when you do refinement, you would say, oh, I'm an API function that doesn't disable the interrupt. But on the other hand, the refinement shows that I'm not ch t touching E or R, so that would be fine. Um, yeah. So when we showed it, so eChronos has actually a very large number of variants. So we're just looking at one variant. And when we showed it to the, the main developers and inventor of eChronos, the, the company we're working with, Breakaway, they could see like all kind of adaptations to the other variants saying, oh, but if we tweak here or if we tweak there, then we could apply to another variant. So yeah. <coughs> yes. So I guess a different version of what Brian asked. Yeah. Do you think the wiki Greeks could apply to application level multi-threaded concurrency or would it explode too much? So application code. So uh, multi-core multi multi or? or multi oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So, if we, multi so, um, so if we were to, ch to to prove application code on um, a single core like here, but multi-threaded. Uh, what would be uh, a little bit better is that you would then usually uh, manage the sharing of data with locks. And so an adaptation would be more like rely guarantee, which is uh, an like uh, kind of a successor of a wiki grease, but that is compositional. Uh, would probably be better at the application level because then you actually own the data before changing it. Whereas here, the variables are just changed without locking them. And so that's why you have you need a bit more fine-grained things and it's very hard to express this in, in, in rely guarantee. You could of course do it, like rely guarantee just comes down to weak degrees, but then you rely might just look like, oh, if, if I'm at this program counter, then this is true. If I'm in this program counter, this is true. So, at the application level, I think this, the general idea of the same approach would work. And actually, that's one of the things we would like to do. Like at the application level, what you want to do is also having an idea of this is my main environment. And it relies on the fact that I'm using a semaphore or a lock to have a critical section. And so I would use the fact that oh, Ikronos provides me with the guarantee that you, know, you have mutual exclusion inside a, a mutex. Um, but then to show your main environment, I think something like rely guarantee would be better. Yeah. Cool. Thank you very much again. Yeah, thank you.